long ago. In a time before man, before the earth, almost before time itself, in the first moments of the Big Bang. Powerfully charged electrons began to pour out of the swirling furnace that filled empty space. Many of these electrons became part of simple hydrogen atoms that formed huge stars. Many of these simple atoms were squeezed together to become the electrical conductors of today when copper, iron, and silver were born. Hidden deep inside each atom, these powerful electron charges remain unchanged for billions of years. But with the advent of man, they were soon to be released as electrical energy. These same electrons cook our food. They help start our cars. Our cities are helpless without them. Our businesses run on them. They delight and bring eye-popping excitement. Without their power, our reach for the stars would only be a dream. They lift us on moving stairs. They transport us from place to place. They bind together the very air that we breathe. They are the building blocks of our minds. Without electricity, even the world itself would no longer be here. How did it come to be? Where is it from? What is electricity? Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Paul McGowan, and over the next hour, we're going to spend some quality time together learning about a subject that I'm very passionate about electrical energy. Now, over the last 35 years, our team at PS has been building high-end home entertainment products that use electrical energy. And over those years, we've been asked a thousand times, what is electrical energy? How is it generated? How does it affect our home AV systems? What's it all mean? Great questions. And we're going to find out together the answers to those. And I'm going to show you over the next hour, how these two items, a magnet and a coil of wire together, changed the course of human history and everything in it forever. Let's start our journey. At the end of the 19th century, a small miracle happened. Music came into people's homes, and it did that not by live means, but by mechanical means. This is a copy of an original Edison mass-produced phonograph. It's entirely mechanical. And unfortunately, my motor's broken, but I can still play it for you because it's mechanical, and I'll show you. <laughs> I love this old piece. Um, I don't spin it that well, but I guess the point is the music that was brought into people's homes changed their lives. And when it came into their homes, we also got something else called marketing. Now, do you recognize him? This is Nipper. Nipper is the RCA dog, and he was usually represented in front of this horn. You, you familiar with that? Has his head cocked, listening for something. Well, the marketing slogan is his master's voice. That's what he's listening for. Now, the reason they did that was because at the time, this was high-end. This was a high-end performer, and they wanted you to believe that it was so high-end that even a dog could be fooled into believing he was hearing his master's voice. And today, high-end and performance is still critically important to all of us when we want to have a great, entertaining experience at home. It's about the performance. And that's what all of these guys want. I closed my eyes, and there was the blackness. You know, you just, 
got the piano and there's all this space around it and it was, it was intense. You know, the third movement of the second piano concerto, woo, you know, I mean, he was flying and I thought, this is what it's about. You know, and we, and we, we get a chance to try to translate that at the system level. Just think about what electricity brings to our modern lives. Because of it, we can watch any movie ever made. We can listen to any concert ever recorded, and we can do this in the comfort of our own homes. And even here, at 35,000 feet in the air, we can not only watch videos as we fly, but we can use one of life's basic building blocks to actually fly a plane. Our amazing technological world is only possible because we control electricity. Electricity is everywhere. It is the DNA of our modern homes and lives and the essence of what runs our home entertainment systems. Without the ability to generate and distribute electrical energy, we'd have no lights, no entertainment, no transportation, and in fact, no communication. Without it, our modern civilization would cease to function within a matter of days. As I mentioned in the beginning of our film, electrons and electrical energy are part of what make up our universe. They are an essential building block in life and created in the first moments of the formation of our universe. Our ability to control electrical energy is an extremely recent event, perhaps less than a couple of centuries ago. But humans and animals have been observing electricity in its most obvious form, lightning, for millions of years. So what is electricity? Well, electricity is a moving force of tiny particles called electrons, which are part of nature's small building blocks called atoms. The atoms are fascinating items, but it is the journey of electrons that we are primarily interested in. And it is these electrons that so fascinated early observers. A few thousand years ago, man discovered that certain types of materials would mysteriously attract one another after being rubbed together as if by an invisible force. Now today, we understand this force is electrons in the form of static electricity. But back then, it was nothing short of magic. The first recorded history of these observations was over 2,000 years ago, when the ancient Greeks discovered that by rubbing amber with fur, small objects like feathers would be attracted by an invisible force. Now, to these ancient investigators, this was truly magic, and the phenomena was literally inexplicable. It seems that man needs to assign meaning to the observations that he makes, and a few thousand years ago, what these people didn't understand were thought to be the work of gods, heroes, and monsters. So, when they observed something as mysterious as invisible forces lifting feathers through the air that they could control, they were totally baffled. They couldn't deny what they saw, but they couldn't explain it either. Come to think of it, that same mentality continues through today. I don't measure music. I don't. Somebody else can measure the equipment to decide what I'm hearing. I don't think that's what happens. They can measure what they measure, and that's what the measurements are. bottom line is I listen oh you're being fooled your brain is fooled well you know what you if that's the case your brain is fooled by living your wife has fooled you your government's fooled you you fooled you, your dog has fooled you everybody's fooled you because you are not as accurate as some stupid test equipment that someone is using to prove to you that you don't hear what you hear I don't live in that world I eat food and I taste it. Oh no, you didn't taste that. You, th the suggestion was there that it would taste good. I'm gonna do a double blind test. I'm gonna blindfold you, I'm gonna cover your nose and come your mouth and now eat it. What do you taste? Nothing. See, I told you it all tastes the same. <laughs> ah! The static electricity these early pioneers discovered took a couple of thousand years before anyone figured out what to do with the discovery. Static electricity is the buildup of a large pool of electrons that sit on the surface of materials waiting to go somewhere. The surface can be just about anything, and the electrons are gathered by rubbing two objects together. 
The rubbing motion is called friction, and friction rips the electrons away from the weaker material and then adds them to the stronger material. The stronger material builds up an excess of these harvested electrons just waiting to go somewhere, usually in the form of a spark. And that's what happens in the most spectacular of all naturally occurring electron buildups, lightning. Hail and high winds within the clouds rips electrons loose and builds up a charge inside the cloud. When there are enough electrons available, the air between the cloud and the earth act as a wire and the cloud discharges its energy in a bolt of electricity. The golden age of electrical discovery started in the 1700s and pretty much exploded in the early 1800s. During that time, guys like Ben Franklin played with static electricity by flying a kite in a thunderstorm and nearly getting killed. Since the only two methods of producing static electricity in the 1700s was rubbing two items together or standing in the rain risking electrocution, someone needed to find a better way to experiment with electricity. Early experimenters built mechanical devices that used friction to produce sparks in excess of two feet long. Later improvements allowed these sparks to be stored in the very first batteries called Leyden jars. It was this newfound level of control that allowed scientists to start understanding electricity and inevitably how to control it. We've seen that friction can move electrons producing static electricity, but later in the century we'll learn that chemicals can move electrons in batteries, light moves them in photocells, and magnets move them in a coil of wire. Now that last fact is a biggie. In 1820, Hans Orsted and Andre Ampere made an amazing discovery. They found that moving electrons created a magnetic field. Now, this was groundbreaking stuff, and it would change the world forever. Now, people have been playing with natural magnets for centuries, but all of a sudden, these guys discover how to make an electric magnet and turn it on or off. This was wild stuff back then. So let's try it for ourselves. I've constructed a simple electromagnet here by taking a steel bolt and wrapping wire around it. Now, if I do not connect the battery, you can see that basically nothing happens with these paper clips. But if I connect the battery to the coil, we create a magnet. And this discovery was taken to the next level by another gentleman named Michael Faraday. Orsted, Ampere, and Michael Faraday all lived about the same time, and one of the problems they faced with this discovery was that the forces that made it possible were invisible, and at no time in history were invisible waves or invisible anything accepted by scientists, and perhaps more importantly, by the church, which was immensely powerful. Now, to suggest otherwise might cost you dearly. The laws of physics of the 19th and early 20th century were written by Sir Isaac Newton a hundred years earlier. Remember him? He's the guy who had an apple fall on his head. Newton explained much about how our world worked and recognized that planets and suns certainly had an effect on one another, but stopped short of saying that there was an invisible connection or field between the planets. Now, he probably understood there must have been some type of invisible connection at work, but to say so publicly might have gotten him in trouble with the church and barbecued at the stake. But scientists could not get around the fact that some invisible force was involved with a magnet. I mean, you can't see what makes it work, but it does work. The answer came from a man with little education and not enough math skills to fully comprehend the physics of Sir Isaac Newton. Now that turned out to be a pretty good thing. Michael Faraday started out life as a simple bookbinder, 
Only Faraday, who was a really smart guy with a near photographic memory, just happened to read every single book he worked on. Many of them were scientific books. Faraday was a profoundly religious man, and his strong beliefs would not allow him to accept the empty spaces theory of Isaac Newton. Invisible forces were easy to believe in if you, like Faraday, believed that God was everywhere, literally. There just simply could be no such thing as empty spaces. With this strong belief in hand, Michael Faraday, in a huge leap of logic, reasoned that if invisible electric forces can make a magnet, then a magnet's invisible forces should be able to make electricity. And in 1831, he built a machine that could generate electricity by holding a wire near a moving magnet, all with invisible waves. So just how big a deal is this? Well, if I can take a magnet and place it next to a coil of wire, like this model we have here. See the magnet? This is the coil of wire and another coil of wire and a light. Now watch what happens when I turn the magnet. Can you see the light? You see it's going from red to green, red to green. This is because the magnet turning near a coil of wire is generating electricity. In fact, it's generating AC electricity. And how big a deal is this? This discovery is going to change everything. Within just one year of Faraday's discovery, electrical inventions began to emerge that would change the world forever. In fact, between 1831 and 1906, a span of just 75 years, we introduced the light bulb, the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, vacuum tubes, transformers, and in another six years, television. Faraday's discovery of how to generate electricity changed the world forever. During the late 1800s, electric power had become a part of city life in America. Instead of the gas lamps used to light city streets and homes, the electric light bulb began to appear. The first electric light was made in 1800 by Humphrey Davy, an English experimenter who played with batteries. Now, when Humphreys connected wires to his batteries, the wires glowed. Unfortunately, they didn't glow for very long. It was American inventor Thomas Edison who took Davy's discovery of the glowing wire and tried to make it last longer than a few seconds. He discovered that if you remove the air and use a special bamboo for the filament rather than metal, the bulb would glow for as long as 1,500 hours. He called it the light bulb. <laughs> In 1878, Edison and financier J.P. Morgan formed the Edison Electric Light Company and, on September 4, 1882, switched on the world's first electric system, lighting up 59 homes in Lower Manhattan. The company grew, and Edison's company became the standard for the U.S. But there was a problem. The entire system ran on low voltage DC, and only homes that were very near to the generating station had bright lights. Other homes, farther away from the generators, had dimmer lights. Okay, here's the situation. Edison's company is growing rapidly. By this time, he's lighting up homes in New York and in New Jersey and doing quite well, but all of a sudden, he faces a bit of a problem. And I'm going to demonstrate that problem to you now with a little experiment here on my bench. Okay, so here's the problem. We set up a little demo to show it. Edison's 
system used DC, which provided lights to people. Unfortunately, those lights were not even in their brightness. So at the beginning of the chain where the power starts, the lights were bright and they went through a long wire and at the end they were dim. So customers at one end, at the farthest away from the power plant, had dim lights. The ones closest had bright lights. Let me demonstrate for you. If we connect up the battery, you can see the first light, which is closest to the battery, is very bright. After it goes through this long set of wire, it's kind of dim. In fact, the voltage out here is about half as much as the voltage coming in here. And that's because the resistance in this wire is causing the voltage to drop. Now, all wire has resistance, and all electrical energy has to uh, combat that resistance, if you will. And so Edison had quite a problem. He had to start building multiple stations, getting them closer and closer to people's homes in order to keep their lights bright. It wasn't a great solution, especially when Edison was trying to grow his company throughout the state. Okay, so now we know the problem. But what do you do about it? Edison didn't have a lot of choice because really the only way around this problem is to raise the voltage considerably higher than what Edison was able to do. Now Edison started out at 100 volts. As I told you at the end of the chain, it got down perhaps half as much, so down to 50 volts, so the lights were uh, half as bright. Now to get rid of the problem though, you need to raise the voltage significantly. So if you could raise the voltage by 100 times or 1,000 times, the problem is reduced by the square of how much you raise it. So the square of a thousand is one million. Now that means if we could take the voltage from a hundred volts to a hundred thousand volts, the problem that Edison was encountering would be reduced by a million times. And that discovery was made by a man named Nikola Tesla. <laughs> At the same time Edison was building his electrical empire, another inventor, George Westinghouse, joined forces with Nikola Tesla to compete with Edison. Westinghouse, who had been working with Alexander Graham Bell to build a modern telephone company, was also interested in electricity and investigated Edison's battery power scheme, but he decided it was just too inefficient to be scaled up to a large size. He believed that Edison's DC battery method was a dead-end street. But there was a new system being developed in Europe at the time, invented by Nikola Tesla. And his system was called AC, and it was able to generate any voltage you needed. And Tesla, Westinghouse, and Edison knew it. Edison chose to ignore it, Westinghouse and Tesla chose to run with it. And the result is what comes out of your home's wall socket today, AC. So we know that the problem with Edison's system was uneven lighting. At the beginning, where the power plant was, you had very bright lights, and he started out with about 100 volts. As it traveled down the wires, maybe a mile or two, it dropped down perhaps in half, and the lights became very dim. Now to solve this problem, Edison's only way out was to build more power stations. And that worked pretty well in a city, but when you try and power an entire state, then you have trouble. So Edison didn't really have a solution, but Tesla did. And Tesla's solution was called AC. Now do you remember this? We have a magnet and a coil of wire and a light. And as I turn this, we make light, we make electricity, but the key is that I'm turning it, okay? So as the magnet turns, we generate electricity in the coil. Now, I'm going to introduce you to Bob Stadther, our VP of Engineering, to explain the rest of the story. Bob? This is a transformer. A transformer consists of a coil of wire, a metal core, and a second coil of wire. Now, if I put electricity into this coil, it creates a magnetic field in the core, and that in turn creates electricity in the second coil. Now by having a different number of turns in my coils, 
I can change the voltage. I've got twice as many turns in this coil as this coil, so I will get twice the voltage out here that I put in here. Now there's one problem with transformers. They don't work well with DC. If I were to connect my transformer to a battery, I'd get a very short burst of power out of this coil, and that would be it. It's sort of like these bellows. If I squeeze the bellows, I get a burst of air out the end. And I can continue to squeeze, but nothing else will happen. But if I pump the bellows back and forth, back and forth, I get continuous air out the end. In the same way with my transformer, if I can reverse my battery back and forth, back and forth, I'll get continuous power out the other side. That's AC. Tesla's new AC solution was just what the world needed to send power over long distances. Edison wanted nothing to do with AC power, well, because he stood to lose his business. To stop Tesla, Edison argued that high-voltage systems were inherently dangerous, and this began what later became known as the War of the Currents. To prove just how dangerous AC was, Edison personally presided over numerous public executions of house pets. When the impact of those electrocutions lessened, he even electrocuted Topsy, an elephant, and finally, Edison invented the electric chair to kill a condemned criminal, Willie Kemmler, to prove how dangerous AC was. In the end, Edison lost the battle, and Tesla and Westinghouse went on to light up the entire 1893 Chicago World's Fair, one of the most spectacular displays of power ever. Okay, so where are we? Well, we've learned that electricity is electrons moving down a wire or a conductor with an invisible wave. We've also learned that we can make a magnet with electricity. And we've learned that we can reverse that process to make electricity by simply moving a magnet near a coil of wire. So how did the pioneers generate electricity at first? With water. After all, people had been using water power to grind their wheat for centuries, and we were quite familiar with using the power of water to spin a wheel. Well, Nikola Tesla did the same thing, and interestingly enough, he did it for the first time just a few miles from where we are now, in Telluride, Colorado, gold mining country. Well, here we are in Telluride, one of the prettiest areas in the state of Colorado. Located in our southern mountains, Telluride is now a popular skiing destination, but it wasn't always that way. In the 1800s, Telluride, whose name, according to popular legend, means to hell you ride, seemed like a place no one wanted to go, unless there was a really good reason. And there was. Gold. During the late 1890s, Telluride's gold mining industry was about to be shut down because all of the timber had been cut down for fuel to run a steam engine that operated the mine. And they could no longer run the mine without the wood to fire the steam engines. Well, it turns out this is a heck of a problem. And to fix it, they'd need a heck of a solution. Their plan was to use electric power generated from falling water to run the mine instead of steam. So when a lot of money's at stake, you turn to the expert in the field, and in this case, it was Thomas Edison. Edison traveled to Telluride to survey the scene because, well, he was anxious to increase his electric power business. Unfortunately, Edison was forced to turn down the job because of the same basic problem he had with delivering power to homes in New York City. As we now know, low voltage DC cannot travel over long distances, remember? The power had to be generated here at the top of this waterfall. It then needs to travel over these wires, which turned out to be made from iron, which is a very poor conductor. And then it needed to travel across this entire valley and to the mine some three miles away. Edison's DC power would not work, and he turned around and left without a contract. But the miners still needed a solution, and if Edison's DC power wouldn't work, what would? Well, the AC system developed by Nikola Tesla and George Westinghouse was perfect. 
In the summer of 1890, a Tesla generator and motor were installed here in Telluride. Now, the generator is at the Ames Hydroelectric Plant, which is where we are right now. The Ames plant is the world's first generating station to produce and transmit alternating current. It uses a Tesla generator that's built by Westinghouse. Now, it's run from the water that comes down the falls from behind us, and it produces enough power to drive the mine and the entire city of Telluride, making it the first city in the United States that was west of the Mississippi that had any kind of electric power. We're standing at one of the world's largest engineering marvels, Hoover Dam. Built in the 1930s, Hoover Dam has been named one of the seven modern engineering marvels of our time. Now to put that in perspective, some of the other seven marvels are the Empire State Building, the Panama Canal, and the Golden Gate Bridge. Hoover Dam was built during America's Great Depression. The structure uses two and a half million cubic feet of concrete, which is enough to build a 16-foot highway from coast to coast, from San Francisco to New York. The dam holds back one of the mightiest rivers in our country, the Colorado, whose headwaters begin within driving distance of PS Audio. To build this mighty structure, the engineers and workers spent a total of four years to complete, and amazingly enough, Hoover Dam came in under budget and on time. Hoover Dam produces electricity through 17 main water-driven turbines. With a rated capacity of 3 million horsepower, the plant can produce about 2% of the electrical energy needs of the entire United States. Today, three quarters of a century later, after this dam was built, the work of Michael Faraday, Nikola Tesla, Westinghouse are all here, and they're all producing electricity in the same manner. In fact, this dam produces two billion watts of power every single moment of every day. And right next door to Hoover Dam is Las Vegas, Nevada. So interestingly enough, the power from Hoover Dam has nothing to do with Las Vegas. All of this is powered with coal. Now, how does a coal-fired power plant work? Let's go take a look. Coal. It's a major source of fuel that the world uses to provide electrical energy. In fact, coal is used to produce about 40% of the world's electrical energy. But what is it? Well, actually, coal is a form of stored solar energy, just like oil and natural gas. We know that oil was formed many millions of years ago from small animals in the seas called diatoms, which used the energy of the sun as food. In the same manner, coal is made from plants millions of years old, who also relied on the sun's energy as a source of nutrition. Now, to generate electricity, we use coal as a fuel source to boil water and make steam. The steam is used to spin a turbine connected to an electrical generator, which is basically a spinning magnet and a coil of wire in exactly the same manner as Hoover Dam used falling water to spin its generators. The power of falling water and the energy available in coal all came from the energy of our sun in a process that continues through today. Let's take a closer look at how we convert the energy of coal to electricity. We're inside a typical coal and natural gas-fired power plant, one probably just like what's powering your home right now. In this plant, which is pretty noisy, we have two main generators, a coal-fired steam electric unit that produces 185 million watts and a natural gas-fired smaller generator producing 40 million watts. In the more conventional steam unit, this big furnace burns coal to boil water and create steam. The coal comes in on these railroad cars, and as you can see, it drops the coal down into a big pile. The coal falls down into grates and goes up this conveyor belt and into the plant. From here, it'll go into a furnace where it creates a lot of heat, which boils water, and then we're going to make electricity. The steam is used to spin a turbine, which forces a magnet and a coil together 60 times a second. The electrons start to move, and we get power. Once we generate the power, we need to step up the voltage and then deliver it to our homes. To transform the power into higher voltage and distribute it, 
The 13,000 volts from the generator goes into here, these giant transformers. Now these will step it up to 115,000 volts and distribute it out to the substation. Inside the transformers are two coils of wire. The first coil is used as a magnet and the second coil as a source of electrons. The two combine together and we get electricity stepped up to a higher voltage. From the generating station, the power is sent over high voltage wires to a substation where it's reduced back to 12,000 volts and sent to a power pole or underground utility near your home. Now the transformer on the pole reduces the voltage one final step to either 100, 120, or 230 volts depending on where you live in the world. Electricity is moving electrons, which travel down a conductor to where they're needed. Those electrons are forced to move by a magnetic field. To generate power, we simply need to place a magnet near a coil of wire. To produce AC, the magnet must move closer and farther from the coil many times a second. And we can mechanize the moving magnet and coil arrangement by placing one of them on a spinning shaft. Then all we need to do is use some form of energy to spin the shaft to get power. We can spin the shaft with any means of mechanical motion, including riding a bicycle, falling water, steam generated from coal or nuclear energy, diesel or gasoline motors, or even wind can be used to spin the shaft. It really doesn't matter. We're simply converting mechanical energy into electrical energy by moving a magnet back and forth near a coil of wire. So once that power gets to your home, now what? Okay, so now the power has gotten into your home, so everything should be perfect, right? Wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because once it leaves the power plant, it's pretty perfect. As it gets out into the world and gets used by industry, by your neighbors, by you, the power gets bad and the quality starts going downhill. Now let me ask you a question. Don't you, like most people, think that what comes into this plug through your public utility, the electric companies, don't you kind of think that's pretty perfect? Nothing wrong with it? Well, the truth is, it's not as great as you think, and it's getting worse. So let's see where we are. We've discovered that electricity is the driving force behind our technological marvels. Electricity is electrons moving at the speed of light in a wave down a wire or through the air. Now those electrons are being pushed around by a magnet that moves back and forth 60 times a second with either water or steam power. Once the AC gets to your home, it should be pretty clean, but it's not, and it's getting worse. From cell phones, computers, industry, and even the very devices that they themselves need clean power are adding pollution to the power on a daily basis. And boy, my life would be a lot simpler if everything made sense. If uh, AC power was just the stuff that turned lights on and off and never made any difference to the system. And if the last six feet between the wall and my CD player didn't make a difference in the way that the system sounded, uh, I'd love it because then the world would be something that I completely understood and it worked according to the rules that I was taught. Unfortunately, it doesn't. And the fact that I can't explain this drives me nuts. Uh, I'm hoping you can explain it. The magnitude of the difference was fully the equal of upgrading a preamp, say, from a mediocre model to uh, virtually a state-of-the-art model. I think it was about 16 years ago, and I'd been used to listening to my hi-fi system without AC power or conditioning. And I had pretty clean AC power because I lived in a semi-rural area. And I put it in the system and connected all the components to it and was really quite shocked at the magnitude of the improvement it made. I heard more low-level detail, a quieter black background, uh, more liquid textures in the mid-range and treble, and just a greater ease in musicality that made it easier to enjoy the music. 
it, the magnitude of the difference was fully the equal of upgrading a preamp, say, from a mediocre model to uh, virtually a state-of-the-art model. What are you listening to? You are listening to your electricity. That's the bottom line. You are listening to the electricity that comes into your house. You're just modulating that electricity. And if the electricity coming in is crappy, you are modulating crap, a crappy signal. And the signal coming out will be crappy. Well, people like to say that the AC power travels through miles and miles of the worst quality cable on Earth, and how can you change it with the last six feet? Well, of course, that's not strictly true. I mean, AC doesn't travel at 120 uh, volts down miles and miles of cable. I mean, it's probably not traveling that far, much more than 30 or 40 feet from your house. Um, but those last six feet, doggone it, do make a difference. And I would change that other 30 or 40 feet if I had the option, but we don't. So we do what we can. I was always skeptical of power cords in particular and AC power conditioners. Because if you think of a power cord as the last four feet of a transmission system that's hundreds of miles long, how can a little different wire make a difference? But you can also think of an AC power cord as the first four feet of the AC power distribution system, where it's really an extension of the transformer's primary winding. From the amplifier's point of view, it's the first four feet. And the first time I heard a power cord difference, a visiting manufacturer, an amplifier designer, was over at my house, and we were comparing two different amplifiers. And after about an hour, we swapped their power cords. And sonic characteristics that I had attributed to the amplifier were actually part of the power cord. Some people, somewhere in some technological backwater, may still believe that AC power has no effect on the sound of equipment. <laughs>I was recently at a high-end show where there was a, a home theater demonstration and it was very well set up. The guy who put it on is one of the real pros in the industry and knows how to do a good demo. It demonstrated exactly what he wanted to show about the equipment and it was good but the thing I first noticed about the system was the fact that the image the video projector was putting out had an incredible amount of noise. I could see the video noise to the point that after his demo I, we, I came in later and put on some of my own source material because I wanted to see if the problem was in the source material or part of his reproduction chain. Put on my piece and there the noise was and I turned to him and said boy it's a good projector. It's a good system. It, you're getting a good performance, but did you notice the noise? And the guy who set up the projector from the back of the room said, yeah, I was afraid you'd see that. <laughs> Since everything we hear and see in our AV systems is, in reality, AC power that's been modulated by a CD, DVD, or vinyl, then it only makes sense that the quality of that power has a great impact on our system's performance. But why do we care about performance and what our systems can achieve? We care because what we see and hear can make a wonderful lasting memory. It can emotionally enrich our lives with a profound impact and it can do so regardless of the medium, recorded or live, if it's a quality experience. It was an intense experience. I mean, you know, Bernstein was always known for his Mahler, and in fact, I think my introduction to Mahler may have been the New York Philharmonic recordings of Bernstein with Bernstein that were made in the 60s. So my friend and I attended the concert, and it seemed like every bit of emotion that was in the piece, and it's an intensely emotional piece, was being wrung even further. It seemed almost too extreme and too intense to take. In fact, when the piece ended with a huge crescendo, the audience just sat there stunned. I mean, it wasn't like any of us could respond for maybe 30, 40 seconds before people just rose to their feet as one and we were just roared. We weren't even cheering. It was just 
a scream uh, of appreciation. We want these emotional experiences. It's why we go to concerts. It's why we watch a play or read a book or interact with our friends and family. We want to be impacted. We want to have enriching experiences. And no experience is quite as profound as those that touch the senses. Well, I think the difference between a performance that is great and a performance that transcends is that it must come from a different place in the artist's heart and in, in their spirit, that it comes not from the centers of the brain that manage the, the muscles, but, but those that are, that are directly connected to the spiritual world, to the, to the angels, if you will. I remember one performance we did of the Beethoven Violin Concerto, and my teacher was the soloist at school at Eastman. And I remember that rehearsal as being absolutely transcendent and magical. There was no concern about what the next note was or, or the, what the timing would be or, or how to get that hard page turn. It was just absolutely in another plane, as if the music had come from the angels and was inevitable and had always been there. And you just were there and, and privileged to be a part of it. That's what these guys want. They want to get as much out of the performance as they can and to a person, whether it be Singapore, whether it be Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, Japan, oh my gosh, here in the United States, the common denominator issue is power. That's a very, very important thing. People need to pay attention to what's going on there. You know that and I know that. I mean, there's an easy test. Forget about everybody's equipment. There's an easy test. When's the best your hi-fi ever sounded? Right? Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning when there's no air conditioners running and it's black as night right in your listening room because that's when you're going to get you know, a little bit of lift on the power. Just an easy thing you can test for yourself. So what makes a film or audio system involving? Well, just as a wonderful meal needs great, skillfully blended ingredients, our home entertainment systems need the right ingredients, skillfully assembled, and fed by one basic pure ingredient, electrical power. Mm -hmm. When I plug in your equipment, your AC conditioning equipment, it just, there's a blackness to the, to the background that you just simply don't have otherwise. The noise floor just subjectively drops. If it had to measure it on equipment, I don't know what it would measure, if it would measure it at all. But when you do as many sessions a year as I do, <clears throat> and that's about 45 a year, you get used to what your equipment sounds like. And you get used to the noise level. And, you know, you get used to certain halls that you work in fairly frequently. And all of a sudden when you listen, after, you've, after I plug in your equipment and use all your AC stuff, and I listen, and I think, well, damn, that's quiet. <laughs> I think at this point, we've pretty well demonstrated how a magnet and a coil of wire generate electricity. But what else do they do? How else are these items used in a home AV system? I want to show you something. What I want to show you is our turntable. Now, this turntable happens to have two arms, a moving magnet arm and a moving coil arm. And Moving magnets and moving coils. Sound familiar? Of course. A moving magnet cartridge is a very simple device, actually. The, the needle or the shaft has a magnet on it and a coil of wire around that magnet. Now, as the needle moves back and forth in the grooves of the record, it gets closer and farther away from the coil and it generates an electric field and we hear music once it's amplified. The moving coil is exactly the same thing, it's just the reverse. Instead of a magnet on top of the needle, now we have a coil on top of the needle surrounded by a permanent magnet.
Now turntables are just the beginning of the chain for making music using coils of wire and magnets. What we hear is also controlled by a coil of wire and a magnet. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with this, so I remove the grill cloth here. A loudspeaker. And loudspeakers have woofers and tweeters for their drivers. Now these drivers are basically devices that move the air in and out and pressurize the air so that we hear sound. This is what's inside of a loudspeaker. This is a cone and here is a large permanent magnet and here attached to the cone is a coil of wire. When we energize that coil of wire the woofer or the tweeter cone moves back and forth, it pressurizes the air and we hear sound. And in a home theater setup we use CD players and DVD players to not only hear music but to watch videos as well. And these use coils and magnets as well. Let's go take a look. Now I'm sure you all recognize this. This is a CD player. And you put a CD here in the drawer, you close it, and it makes music. Uh, a DVD player, the same thing, but we get music and video. Now this has a laser, and that laser moves back and forth with a coil of wire and a magnet and reads what's on the CD or the DVD. So not only do coils and magnets generate electricity, they also generate what we hear and what we see in a home AV system. We do all of this because we want these experiences in our home. I mean, let's face it, a great home AV system is a kick in the pants. I mean, this is, this is great stuff, and we all love it. It's why we do this. It's why we're involved with this. And, you know, the system's reached a certain point where it's, it's really good now. And I put a record on that I haven't played in years. I, it is just so much pleasure. It is just one of the most, it's one of the pleasures in life. The, the next most pleasurable thing is to bring someone down here who's never heard a good stereo, who thinks they know what music sounds like recorded, and you bring them down and you say, sit there, what do you want to hear? And maybe they'll go, it, I don't have an ear. I said, well, you have two of them, actually. <laughs> I, I don't have the ear for this. I said, of course you do. I, I don't think I can appreciate it. Well, what do you like? Oh, uh, Beatles, or whatever. And you put it on, and the first thing they go is, my God. Are those the speakers? And they're pointing to the amplifiers because the sound's coming, you know, from the stage in the middle. They go, those are the speakers? No, those, but, but the sound's not coming from them. Well, that's the whole idea, my friend. The, the speakers aren't supposed to be heard. They're supposed to just produce this field in front of you. And they go, well, this is wonderful. I, I would like to have this. How come I've never known about it? Why don't I know about this? And the reason is, in America, it's not written about. It's just the mainstream media. Just, they neglect this subject. They talk about good wine good food and you know the experiences in our country have improved in most ways we have better food we have better wine we have better clothes people drive better cars they know all about the good things but when it comes to listening to music they listen on crap they put the speakers in the ceiling you know they don't want to see the speakers it's bad dirty and then you know do, do you ever go see live music does it come from over your head no and it sounds terrible. And then they say they, they put it all in their servers and they reduce it to an MP3. And of course they're not going to want to sit and listen to it. Would you want to sit and listen to that? You can't. You can have it in the background and suck the parasitical life out of the musicians that you've put on your server. So when someone hears something like this and they realize what a great experience it is, you know what they say sometimes? Wow, I'll make room in my house for a pair of speakers. This is really a cool thing. Yep, pretty cool. If you've never heard a great AV system, I encourage you to go out to your local dealer, wherever you can find one, and find out just how exciting this really is. Now you can have this level of enjoyment in your home, and it doesn't have to be expensive. What's important is that you have a great, solid foundation, and that foundation is AC power. So make sure you pay attention and you get the AC power right. We're at the end of our time together, I really hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. It's been a lot of fun. As music lovers and responsible world citizens, we should be aware of the growing environmental problems caused by electrical generating plants throughout the world. Our hunger for electrical energy is growing and the resources to provide that energy are decreasing. But with understanding, 
comes hope for the future. So let me leave you with one last thought. We tend to take for granted the wonders of our technological world, but if you looked inside of your television, your iPod, stereo system, or computer, you would find nothing but cold, functionalist metal blocks without the discoveries of men like Tesla, Edison, and Faraday. We all stand on the shoulders of these great electrical giants. To have all of this, See if it works. Yeah, I guess that worked. Just look at the camera. You can see me going like this without actually looking at me, okay? Christian, so just look at the camera and give me like. Okay. So you want I want to do this like by myself okay. and not Everybody tell me. Come on over here. We all stand on the shoulders of these great electrical giants. There's nothing up there. There is all sorts of stuff up there. All right, all right, all right. What's it? The high-end system is all about the setup. It starts going, I was like, whoa, and I'm reeling this sucker in, and it took me five minutes to reel it in. And 